Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Our show today, Waging a Just War. Thou shalt not kill, probably the most famous moral commandment in the Western world. And yet, the doctrine of a just war, justified killing, also has a central place in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Just what kinds of military action does the doctrine of a just war permit, and what kinds does it prohibit? And what does the doctrine of just war have to tell us about the war on terrorism that we ourselves are now conducting? Joining us today, three guests. Reverend William McLennan is Dean of Religious Life at Stanford University. Rabbi Daniel Lappin is President of Toward Tradition. And Father Robert Sirico is President of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. President Bush on November 8, 2001, quote, we wage a war to save civilization itself. We did not seek it, but we must fight it. The war against terrorist networks around the world. Rabbi, are we justified, clearly justified, as clearly as the president suggests, in fighting this war? Uh, absolutely, only if we do it deliberately and with resolve and with the intent to actually win. Father? We're not only justified, I would say that the United States is obligated to pursue this. Reverend? We have to be very careful as we're pursuing it to not have civilian uh, casualties beyond uh, the kind of casualties that we're, we've seen already. Uh, can I ask you, does it make you at all jittery or nervous or uneasy that the president so directly associates American war end, ends with civilization itself? Does that make you a little nervous? It does. I mean, civilization uh, has many forms and has historically. And um, I'm concerned about uh, thinking about Islamic civilization as well as uh, Christian and Jewish civilization. Does it bother you? No, not at all. I mean, America is the only country in the whole world uh, that has an illegal immigration problem. Most other countries are people trying to get out. So I, I don't think, in the same way we might uh, well say, look, a, a Lexus is a better car than a Yugo, I feel no difficulty at all saying Judeo-Christian based Western civilization is a superior civilization to many others. Father? I would say that uh, in this particular instance, it is civilization, and, and by civilization I mean a civilization that res respects a an authentic form of plurality that would also regard the rights of Islamic people to practice their faith, uh, but Islamic people to practice their faith who, who will relinquish the use of coercion and terrorism. Okay, so let's begin with the opening conundrum. Moses come da comes down from Mount Sinai with laws graven by God on the tablets, and one of them is, thou shalt not kill. Solomon's famous verse in Ecclesiastes, everything has its season, there is a time for everything under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot the planted, a time to kill and a time to heal. How are we to reconcile this fundamental conundrum, a time to kill and thou shalt not kill? Now, Rabbi, since your faith has been working on this one for about 3,000 long, years longer than ours, we'll begin with you. Sure. Well, uh, step number one is if, if we are going to quote uh, the, the root of Judeo-Christian tradition, the, the scriptures of, of uh, what are called the Old Testament, then I think it's only right to point out that um, there is an enormous difference between the morality system that is given to individuals and the morality system that is given to governments. For instance, uh, I, Judaism utterly supports capital punishment. That doesn't mean any individual has the right to go out and kill anybody, but governments may execute. That's one of the fundamentals. Nobody can take something from somebody else without his permission, but governments tax. Now, many people aren't too crazy about that, but certainly one thing that everyone would agree governments can tax for um, is for self-defense purposes. So in the same way that there are different sets of moralities for individuals with respect to execution and taxation with respect to governments, similarly when it comes to making war, the fundamental job of a government is to defend its citizens and to proceed to do so. A question about Christianity. Is it possible to reconcile the tension between the Christian traditions of pacifism and just warfare? Within Christianity, we've got a couple thousand years now in which a notion of justified or justifiable warfare coexists with a quite strong pacifist impulse elaborated theologically in some traditions less so in others in the protestant tradition you have to this day mennonites certain quaker groups would be pacifist within the catholic tradition the catholic monastic workers. exactly sure. so now how is it how is it that christianity can say at one and the same time War can be justified, but even in instances in which it is, 
pacifism can be a noble a response, Reverend? Well, if you think of the first 300 years of the Christian church, it was a pacifist church. If you think of what Jesus said in terms of blessed are the peacemakers, love your enemies, turn the other cheek, and so on, right. it's been very hard for many Christians not to see pacifism as a legitimate uh, response. Isn't that an elaboration of the rabbi's point? That is, say, that is to say, for, the, for its first 300 years, Christianity didn't have enough influence in any individual state to face the question of what it, when it is legitimate for a state, up until Constantine converts, Christianity is mostly an association of individuals, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, so is the pacifist impulse acceptable only for individuals? Or? No, I mean the pacifist impulse has also been one that's been seen as a, uh, an obligation of states as well, certainly from oh, the, the uh, Mennonite or the, the Quaker position. It's certainly not the uh, first three centuries of the Christian church because you have uh, soldiers who convert to Christianity. There's no admonition of them to uh, relinquish their positions. Uh, you also have St. Paul in uh, Romans 13 saying that, that the government has the sword to execute righteousness. So I think that this distinction between uh, the, pa and, and I like the phrase you use when you say the pacifistic impulse. It is a tug. And I think that the just war theory emerges out of the acknowledgement of that tug that we have to uh, restrict the use of violence for good aims. It's regrettable that we have to use violence, but there are some times where it is necessary and even uh, required to defend. And so it's never a pacifistic, the nature of the state is that it has a monopoly of coercive force. Okay, then let me put this one to you. We know the story of the Good Samaritan. He comes along a road, finds a man who's been beaten by robbers and stops to bind up his wounds and takes him to care. So, okay, now, so suppose he comes along 30 minutes earlier when the robbers are in the act of beating him up. At that point, doesn't he have a positive duty to intervene if he can? I think you always have a positive duty to try to intervene. The, okay. the, the question is how you're intervening, what the mechanism of intervention okay. is, what kind of uh, weapons you may uh, have and, on your... And if he were the Romans... Questions of prudence, and, and that's exactly okay, what so the there's just Even war. here, there's no distinction in principle. You wouldn't disagree in, with, in no. principle. Pacifism to me is not passive in the sense of not doing anything. It always has to be active and engaged. And okay. pacifists, the Martin Luther King, Gandhi, and so on, uh, these, are, these are activists. Okay. Let's examine the just war doctrine in some detail, beginning with the right reasons for going to war in the first place. The just war theory breaks uh, the notion of a just war into two large categories, use ad bellum, that is to say justification for going to war, and then uh, use in bello, the right way to conduct a war. I will now compress several centuries of thought into television time and <laughs> click down the fundamental criteria for use ad bellum, that is to say the right reasons for going to war, and you tell me whether the conflict in which this country is now engaged meets these criteria, and the way, uh, way in which the president had reasoned the things through and talked about it with the American people meets the criteria, okay? A just war is defensive. It's aimed at protecting innocent against aggression. It's undertaken with right, right intention, that is, not the intention of conquering or plundering, but establishing a just peace. This work qualifies so far? Pretty good. No problem? Yes. No problem, okay. Last three criteria. There are more, but I take these as the most important ones. A just war has to be undertaken with a reasonable expectation that the means employed will be proportionate to the ends sought. It must be undertaken only as a last resort, and it m may be undertaken only when there is a reasonable probability of success. No problems here? Bingo. And, and also legitimate authority. This is the entire international community that is speaking out on this. I, I have this basic problem with the whole thing here, Peter, which it's, is we're that... We're being too uh, elaborate for you? Uh, to some extent, yes. What I'd like to know is uh, if anybody can tell me when was the last time there was a conflict in which the losing side said, that's all right, I, we don't mind losing, they're fighting a just war after all. You know, it's, when was there actually any group of people that bought into this stuff? I don't believe there has been a time, number one. Number two, let's not get dewy-eyed and sentimental about uh, American uh, sports fans. When we root enthusiastically for our team, it isn't because of their good sportsmanship and their altruism, darn it, it's because they're winning, that's why. 
And for the same reason, this notion that our coalition here is going to be sustained because we're constantly assuring them that this is just, that's not what's going to sustain a coalition. What sustains a coalition is conviction that America is in this for the long term, it's dedicated to win, that we're not going to leave them to hang but out surely, to dry along the way. But surely, Rabbi Lappin, you, you, you will agree that we have to restrain. It's not just full anything goes in order to win. Uh, that there has to be proportionality, that, uh, that innocent uh, uh, civilians should not be targeted in this engagement. Well, Father Sirico. Geneva Conventions. It's why yeah. we have uh, the U.S. military code and did, so on. This did, is all, a lot of these rules that we did talk Stalin about Did Stalin fight war. by the Geneva Convention? Did the North Vietnamese fight by the... No, and you were talking about we civilization. Are the superior culture you were talking you about spoke. civilization. And here we have the reason why people write books like uh, The Suicide of the West and Jean-Francois Revelle's How the Western Democracies Perish. So, oh, now, now you're no, making... It, go so, back so, to our so original founding. Patrick Henry, in March 7, 1775, spoke to the Assembly, and he said, the battle is not to the strong, it is also to the vigilant, the active, and the brave. I didn't hear him yes. say anything about the just and the righteous. He didn't say that's why we're going to have of allies. But all of those qualities are just and righteous qualities. For a government, we do not want to hear that our women are being raped and our people are being killed, but our government fought a but just war. Rabbi, okay, so as a practical matter, do you see then that the way the war has been conducted so far has been in some way overprudent? that the government has somehow been too hesitant, that is to say that we're permitting our own morality to tie us in no, knots I, and make I, us ineffective? I've see? got to say that I, I, I do believe it's been prosecuted brilliantly. I think it's been precisely the right okay. combination. So it's just the conversation at this table that's annoying you at the moment. Uh, <laughs> not annoying me, Peter. Not All right. annoying me. Okay. No, but I, I think yes. that you look at what the United States is doing in terms of dropping not just bombs but food. Right. And the uh, spontaneous impulse of American citizens and sending blankets and, and other things to the innocent civilians. This is a right and just, and this is the, if there's let, this superiority of culture, this me, is it. Let me go on to this second category. On to use in Bello, the right conduct of war. Two big ideas. Proportionality. You're not allowed to use any more force than is necessary to achieve the just end. And discrimination which means no intentional killing of innocent civilians. Now, let's take discrimination. During the Second World War, we bombed Dresden, we firebombed Tokyo, of course Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I'd like to get to those in a moment. Were those unjust? Uh, the very point of the firebombing of Tokyo was to kill civilians. Likewise, the very point of attacking Dresden, which was also firebombed, was to kill civilians. Were those actions in and of themselves unjust? Reverend? Yes, they did not meet just war doctrine. No question about it. Yes, yes, they, they would were be unjust. Unjust. Inju unjust. Rabbi? Well, I, I don't see it quite as simply as that. I'd like somebody to explain to me why is it that it's permissible to assault the man who's dropping a bomb on me or throwing a bomb at me and prevent him from doing so, but it's not permissible to stop the person back home who's manufacturing the bomb in the first place. All warfare is essentially economic at root. Uh, it takes a certain amount of resources in order to keep men at the front and to produce ammunition and fling it at the enemy. And war, if war means winning, then it means undercutting the enemy's economic capacity to wage so, war. But bombing, he makes a basic point, though. I mean, in the medieval times, you could tell the peasants apart from the knights, but that is not the difference between civilians and military personnel is blurrier now, the, right? But, but the fact it, that it's complicated doesn't mean you disregard the distinctions. Right. To, to right. target a, a bomb factory is justifiable, but to target an entire city, much less to drop an atomic bomb on, on a city where you know they're going to be in a well, I believe that the uh, ending of the war in the Pacific by dropping the, the bombs on Japan were among the most just and moral things that were ever done. Okay, because now, now I'm not this, sure this any, many of us would be here if there had to have been a land invasion This would be proportionality, Japan. and I wanted to ask about this, the yes. Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We have Edward Teller, who's here at Stanford, 90-some yes. years old and still active writing and speaking. God Edward Teller him. said, we did wrong. We should have conducted a, a kind of demonstration in the exactly. atmosphere. Exactly. So look, if I had a job on a university campus, I'd also say that now. But the fact is, he didn't say it back then. And well, nobody did, sensible it, it, said it, it back then. It never then. reached President Truman. Yes. So your point is that given what Truman knew, it was a just thing to do. You know, look, um, Queen Victoria obstructed the development of the submarine because it offended her sense of just war. Um, Pope Urban II in, in, in 1097, I think it was, uh, prohibited the use of the crossbow because it violated his sense of, of a just war. Well, the, those people who subscribed to that, like Britain in World War I, suffered rather badly for, as a result of these notions. So, so then what's the distinction between um, 
the civilization that you say is superior going into war and barbarians. Well, how would you distinguish a, a barbarous act of military exercise and one that would be a civilized act? Uh, a war launched uh, offensively and for conquest as opposed to a war that is designed to protect and its no own rules citizens. in the midst of the war in defending your citizens everything's legal in in terms of what you do that there are going to be immoral activities on the part of individual soldiers at certain times no we're talking about Certainly policy so, but going the policy, in with principles. prosecution of the war the object is to win, obviously, to do so with the least possible destruction. But and what the about least the Geneva Conventions? And what about the U.S. military code? That well, as I asked you, you know, do you before, torture prisoners? Uh, Reverend, you see, not everybody buys into the Geneva Conventions. And so if you're going to hobble yourself by your own morality, it's not going to look pretty. Reverend, let me put it to you. If you believe that it was plausible, it may have been incorrect, but it was plausible for President Truman to accept the estimates that something like one million or 800,000, a huge number of casualties would be involved by a conventional invasion of the home islands of Japan. Whereas you kill 100,000 or 200,000 or 250 or 300,000 by bombing Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now the difference is they're civilians. How do you, how do you, t uh, how do you cut that Gordian knot, that moral knot? Well, there are certain duties that we, we must uphold regardless of consequences. I mean, you make a consequentialist argument, you can say torture of, of prisoners of war is always justified because you're able to get information you wouldn't get otherwise, Would you say then there are certain kinds of weapons, biological weapons, nuclear weapons, that are unjust in and of themselves? I think there's a real issue with, especially those weapons, that we will destroy the Earth. I think we're at a new time historically now where we have the capability of destroying the entire Earth. You that don't buy a that. New well, moral, I have another question. Moral stance for can us. I also oh, Hold on, let me just yeah. ask you, are there some weapons yeah. that are unjust in and of themselves? Um, no, no. I, I, oh, I, you, I see. You, you, it's all context, you, prudential judgments. Me, yes, I think you'd have to give me an example of it. I could even, I, I don't like to contemplate the use of uh, biological warfare, but if it was, for instance, uh, used against a particular dictator or military operation. From biological warfare to economic warfare, is the economic embargo on Iraq just? Ever since the Gulf War, some, a decade and some years ago, uh, we have enforced and supported an economic embargo on Iraq. The target is Saddam Hussein. He's still in power, but hundreds of thousands of Iraqis have suffered as a result of the embargo. Has the embargo been just, or does that violate the principle of discrimination, Father? Uh, I think that it has not only been unjust, I think it has been manifestly ineffective. I have been against the embargo. I think what you want to create in You've the situation... You've been against the embargo from day one on principle? From or, day one on or, principle. Because it's I unjust? Think, yeah, I, well, I think it's imprudent and unjust. Reverend? Same. Same. Rabbi? Well, you know, again, I'm in trouble here, Peter. Whatever happens on my left and on my right, I, I'm in trouble. Look here, there's one fundamental issue which, which I think uh, needs to be clarified. That is, certainly in the eyes of God, all human beings are equal. I'm sure we'd agree with that. However, ladies and gentlemen, in the eyes of the United States government, I don't want all human beings to be seen as equal. I want the United States government to view American blood as more precious than anybody else's blood. That's what a government needs to do. That seems to me such a very basic basic moral issue that it, one can hardly go further. It, that is important. I, I think if yes, that... But you don't want the United States government or any other government to have absolute license in defending its own citizens. No boundaries, no restrictions. If it's a choice between American blood or foreign blood, the role of the government is to make but sure that it is not that. America's that's blood. A but that's, that's a position for all governments of the world. I mean, what, what about international sure, law? And what about Patrick the United said, Nations? What about God Trump? decides some of these things? That's, that is how the world might, works. Might makes right. Okay, now let me ask you again. That, in, in the, from the point of view of, of protecting American citizens, absolutely. It's not a case of might makes right. It's that protecting American and citizens And you would say the same right. about any nation. Or is it because well, the American experiment nation, is so unique? Well, when has any nation said, yep, we're losing, but you guys are fighting a just war, so we, we accept this? No, but this. I think the reason that America is worth defending is because it's based on principles of law and not might. That's true, and those laws have to do with the relationships between the United States government and okay. its citizens, Let me not ask with you. relationship to, to enemies. New question, although mm. uh, uh, this is hypothetical, maybe not hypothetical. Certainly it isn't far-fetched. Let us assume that we never discover information that ties Saddam Hussein directly to the terrorist attacks of September 11th, but we get information 
which is credible, perhaps not beyond a reasonable doubt, but credible, that he has his hands on, or will soon have his hands on, nuclear weapons, biological weapons, chemical weapons, weapons of mass destruction. Now, everybody around the table, well, Scotty uh, McLennan here didn't make a fire-breathing statement, but the two of you came close, <laughs> said that, th that uh, war can become an obligation, mm -hmm. a yeah. positive duty. If we know that Saddam Hussein has his hands on weapons of mass destruction, does it become our duty to go after him and take him out, Reverend? It depends on how we do it, yes. I would like to see those weapons of mass destruction destroyed, and that's why the precision targeting capability that we have, the kind of intelligence that we should, we should make sure we have, the understanding of international banking and how money moves and so on, we, okay. need, to, we need to, but we, we shouldn't go after the country as a whole. Reverend, are you saying that uh, the minute that a, a, an American puts on a uniform, he's in a different category. He now sort of becomes an official paid gladiator. Everybody else is immune to the impact of war, but he now is a legitimate target of the enemy, whereas you and I are not. Is that, is that what we're well, saying? And we turn it the other way around and say, infants uh, are, are soldiers, just because they happen to have been born yesterday and they're, they're lying in a cradle and somewhere. And that's why our obligation to win is so absolutely crucial, because to defend infants, we must depend on our strength, not on the adherence of the enemy to the Geneva Conventions, is how I see it. But are you, are you saying we should abandon the Geneva Conventions, well, abandon me, international law, abandon the, the civilized standards? Let me put it this way. If you get in the middle, you're not just oh, a... Oh, all right. Oh, no, 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 he's, no, he's I'm being a pacifist <laughs> here. Here's, here's the question. He's just letting this one take place. If you could save 500 American lives by torturing one of the uh, Islamic prisoners currently in custody, would you personally be willing to wield the pliers? No. See, I would, no, absolutely. And, and, and the problem with that is that you don't know that you can really do it. Because it's precisely... This is hypothetical. No, but, you, but you don't analyze. know it. Let me take, but you don't know it. You uh, see, if we reduce ourselves to this level of barbarism, then what is it we're defending? Last, the role of the clergy themselves. Since September 11th, we've heard a lot. The gen I think it would be fair to characterize the general tenor of comments from the clergy as a kind of admission that war is a necessary evil. This is regrettable, it's sad, it is an evil, but it is a necessary evil. There is, however, when it comes to questions of public morale, a problem. And that is this. You cannot ask men and women in uniform to risk their lives, or people here at home to engage in a protracted, difficult, uncertain conflict by saying that you are now engaged in a necessary evil or a sad or regrettable conflict there needs to be some sense of a trumpet sounding here. So my question is this, isn't it the, the appropriate, indeed the moral message for clergy to be stating from the pulpits and in synagogues uh, that our cause is just and that waging this war is not just to, not to be regretted, but that this war is actually to be embraced? Reverend? No. No, uh, how come? Well, because we have a, uh, an obligation, I think, as clergy to present it um, as we see the biblical or Quranic or whatever tradition we're in, as we see it. We have an obligation to uphold the kinds of standards we've been talking about in terms of just war all along here. Um, we can't simply have a jingoistic uh, approach. Father, the, one of the biggest churches, or so far as I know, the, the most prominent Catholic church in the financial end of Manhattan, just a couple blocks from the World Trade Center, is Our Lady of Victory. Yes. Would it not be, let's say, refreshing, if not indeed useful, if Catholic clergy, instead of praying for a rapid end to this conflict, for rest, pray for victory. Pray for victory. Oh yes, and to invite Saint Michael the Archangel and all of that. Yes, but that's not to say that that a uh, good action that needs to be engaged in cannot also be regrettable. If you have to have your wisdom teeth pulled, you need to do that. But it's regrettable. Yeah, but don't you grant this problem of of? I mean, if you were a military chaplain, how could you? What I'm looking for here is a kind of tone. Yeah. Here, here's one where no, I'm I, the rabbi I think altogether. The tone if you're in a war, you've I, got to back no, these people. I, it's, it's, more, it's, it's even it's more than that. America has been spoiled. We Americans have never known what it is to be truly invaded. And with respect to the reverend, whom I've, I've come to enjoy, um, I bet, sir, that if, God forbid, under the darkest scenario, America was invaded, and vicious, cruel, uh, conscienceless, killing barbarians were three blocks away from your home on the Stanford campus, I bet you'd be out there cheering on our boys just as aggressively as you possibly could with no reservations whatsoever. And it's only the luxuries we enjoy here that allow this kind of unrealistic detachment. He's, he's accusing you of indulging in luxury. <laughs> well, I, 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 
I simply don't think it's true. I, mean, I enjoy the, the, <laughs> the exchange question. here. Yeah, yeah. Last question. Last question. It has to be the last question because it's television. As I've said, there's evidence. I think the general tenor among clergy is nervousness, hesitation, and so forth. And in a parish not far from the place where we are shooting this show, a priest refused to permit his people to sing America the Beautiful because he did not want to associate the church with the American war aims. There is a danger, and there is historically a danger, and this is probably the, the core problem with some of the more extreme elements of Islam, of conflating religion and the state. And I understand that concern. But to be patriotic, to have a sense of national uh, justification in this effort is fully uh, appropriate. And I think uh, not as part of the liturgy, but in the context either before or after right. the service, yes. Rabbi Lappin. Father Sirico, Reverend McLennan, thank you very much. Thanks, Peter. And for Uncommon Knowledge, I'm Peter Robinson. Thank you for joining us.